Hello, I'm Sharda Balgopalan, and I currently teach at the Department of Childhood Studies at Rutgers University in the United States. My research broadly focuses on marginal children's experiences with compulsory schooling, labor, gendered school spaces, children's rights discourses, and pedagogies of citizenship. I draw on post-colonial theorizations in my work and have found this framework useful in helping situate contemporary efforts aimed at improving the lives of marginal children as well as in helping analyze these children's experiences of these efforts. So there's been so much work done on post-colonial theory and there are several different strands of theorization and my presentation does not attempt a summary of these. Rather, I focus and I've organized this presentation around five key points and these are aspects of post-colonial theorizing that I think are significant for research on children and childhoods, and which I have found useful in my ethnographic and archival research. So let me begin with a broad introduction. The publication of Edward Said's Orientalism in 1978 is usually viewed as the principal reference point for postcolonial theory. Said spoke about how practices of knowledge formation set in place by imperialism often shape the imagination of the other or the non-Western or the Orient. These discourses help set in place a particular hierarchy with the settler colonial authority emerging as the most civilized and the native requiring civilizing. So what post-colonial theory focuses on are the continuing effects of colonialism as a particular historical condition. So by doing that, it helps open up our contemporary lives as deeply shaped by continuing traces of this colonial past. And it foregrounds colonial conquest and occupation as not limited to the physical conquest of territories and resources, but also in terms of the implications of colonial conquest as deeply entangled in the longer and more insidious occupations of minds and the parallel devaluation of cultures, epistemologies, and identities. So therefore, as Gurminder Bhamra um, has said, what post-colonial theory does is challenge the insularity of historical narratives and historiographical traditions emanating from Europe. And therefore, post-colonial theory has been a very useful framework in all kinds of research that focuses on the historically determined relationships of domination and subordination, as Mudimbe had theorized. So some of the key influences and the key theorists in post-colonial um, theorization include Franz Fanon, Edward Said, Gayathri Spivak, Stuart Hall, um, and several of the other names listed on the slide. Now, moving on to the next slide. So in terms of the five key points that I would like to focus on today, the first of which is that Post-colonial theorists alert us to the continuing effects that colonialism exercises on, the conte on contemporary racialized representations and the related epistemic devaluation of particular populations. Second, by directing our attention to the ethnocentrism of Western modernity, post-colonial theorizations also help trouble the hegemonic temporality of modernity as both linear and singular. Third, they help unsettle the triumphant utopianism that often underlies humanist interventions and help situate these knowledge claims within a more fraught colonial past. Four, post-colonial scholars are invested in reframing marginalized figures 
and bringing into conversation heterogeneous knowledges that have been repressed by the hegemonic West. But in doing this, they also caution against viewing the inclusion of previously subjugated voices as a transparent and simple exercise. And my last point that I'm going to focus on is how the post-colonial critique of linear modernity has also extended to the political economic domain through a different analysis that certain post-colonial economists have offered on post-colonial capitalism. So post-colonialism, to kind of uh, summarize, works to challenge dominant narratives and to reconfigure them in order to provide more adequate categories of analysis. And post-colonial acts as more than a simple shorthand for anything that is non-Western or non-white. Rather, it signals a complex and dense conceptual debates around the status of the subject, around the continuing effects of historical exclusions, and draws our attention to the historical amnesia about the continuing effects of this colonial past on the present. And the child is a figure that lends to this historical amnesia because of the focus on children's futures. And post-colonial theory is particularly useful in a framework for kind of unpacking the historical amnesia that the child figure usually embodies. So the first point that I'd like to focus on is on the epistemic and material devaluation of certain populations that post-colonial theory alerts us to. So the colonial past as a critical aspect of post-colonial theorization is not limited to foregrounding the material realities of colonial exploitation, but is more precisely about tracing linkages between colonial power and knowledge formation. So to go back to Edward Said, he powerfully reminded us that colonial exploitation propelled was propelled by ideological formations, which included notions that certain territories and people require and beseech domination. So the ensuing production and organization of racialized categories that emerged from this colonial experience served as a regulatory principle for organizing the civilizing mission of colonialism. It helped set in place new classifications, social taxonomies, and transformed the earlier, more fluid categories into rigid classifications. And this kind of transformation is what post-colonial anthropologists and historians like Bernard Kahn and Mahmoud Mandani, Partha Chatterjee, have traced in relation to the ways in which colonialism reified existing categories of religion, tribe, region, gender, age, and caste among the natives through new governmental technologies of enumeration, census, race, cartography. And in doing so, they also helped kind of bring to light how Europe was made by imperial projects. And this is, uh, I'm quoting Co Cooper and Stoller, that Europe was made by imperial projects as much as colonial encounters were shaped by conflicts with Europe itself. And so post-colonial theory pays close attention to this dialectical relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. So broadly speaking, in making a strong case against essentialism and by drawing our attention to the construction of difference as a dialectical process, Postcolonialism alerts childhood studies scholars to the need to historicize the categories through which we frame difference, as well as to recognize difference, including cultural and regional differences, as that which is produced within history. So the second key point that I'd like to highlight is the 
hegemonic temporality of modernity and the view of modernity as both linear and singular. So um, what happens with this hegemonic temporality of modernity that colonialism sets in place is that the rest of the world comes to be seen in terms of the differences they mark when viewed into, against this capitalist modernity. So this particular construction of this process of capitalist modernity naturalizes the narrative of historical transition, or namely the logic that requires all assumed non-modern societies to mark their progress by adhering to this predetermined trajectory of Western modernity as has been theorized by Partho Chatterjee. Dipesh Chakravarti, um, the post-colonial historian, talks about this linear framing as linked to the underlying assumption of capital as a universal category through which history becomes knowable. And post-colonial theory has also helped um, demonstrate how this kind of Western linear temporality sustains epistemic and material hierarchies. This is namely that Europe or whiteness within settler colonial context serves as the settled model for where the rest of the world should arrive. And the naturalization of this framing constructs historical time as a measure of cultural difference. So this temporality of this cultural difference or the non-modernness of some cultures gets particularly emphasized around the development of institutional of, of institutions and liberal democratic processes that are viewed as already existing in the West. So what post-colonial theorization does by drawing attention to this hegemonic temporality of modernity as both linear and singular is that it enables childhood study scholars to strongly challenge the transition narrative that underlies the linear temporality of normative childhood and work with the temporalities and relationalities that mark multiple modernities. However, this recognition of multiple modernities is not a multicultural accommodation of the difference that the non-West represents. Rather, it is about coming to grips with the social and historical hierarchization of lives that emerged from this imperial past. So the third point that I'd like to highlight as a key point is the ways in which uh, post-colonial theory has helps us challenge humanist interventions. So post-colonial theorizations have helped unsettle the triumphant utopianism that often underlies humanist interventions as an authoritative break from an oppressive past. They do this by historicizing humanism's more inclusive moves as a value that arose within European and American societies whose colonial civilizing mission engendered a violent insertion into modernity for a majority of the world's people. So they're helping us historicize this, this humanism. And by highlighting the adverse effects of humanism's self-serving suppression of heterogeneous subjects, in privileging the Western male adult rationality as normative, post-colonial research has helped foreground how this was and is, continues to be tied to a parallel narrative in which some humans get viewed as more human than others. In doing this, uh, for example, we can think of how post-colonial feminist scholars like Trinti Minha in 1989, Chandra Talpade Mohanty in 1997, have firmly tied the rise of the beleaguered figure of the third world woman to the paternalism or the self-congratulatory tokenism of Western liberal feminism. So in foregrounding the more fraught colonial circulation of, of concepts like freedom and rights, it explores how colonization produced the historical condition in which 
As Albert Memmi says, the visible apparatus of freedom coexists with the concealed persistence of unfreedom. So therefore, post-colonial theory helps us read against the grain the assumed universality as well as the stability of meaning that usually underlies concepts like freedom and rights. It draws our attention to the concealed persistence of unfreedom and thereby helps unpack the tensions and ambiguities that underlie the implementation of universal projects within national contexts in the global South. In helping unpack it, it moves us away from a deficit framing of those populations in relation to the universal, and instead helps point to the epistemological hierarchies as well as the racist logics that often underlie these universal projects. So now moving on to the fourth point is around post-colonial theory cautioning us against framing inclusion as a simple and transparent exercise in retrieving marginal voices. So efforts to retrieve subjugated knowledges are often are impossible to disassociate from the colonial will to power. Strong traces of this past continue to shape these processes of retrieval and the subjective claims made around previously marginal populations. So Gayatri Spivak's essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, explains how projects to retrieve an authentic subaltern voice are never outside the historically mediated politics of representation. Moreover, she also gestures to the complications and pitfalls entailed in our desire to frame the subaltern as a subject of their own history. So in this essay, Spivak famously realigns the existing tension between silence and agency by foregrounding the patriarchal complicity that helps frame the subaltern as a legitimate and audible subject. So in drawing attention to the subaltern, it is the hermeneutics of retrieval of voice that Spivak is drawing our attention to. And she's also requiring us to be more mindful of the exclusions that remain. So her theorization of the subaltern forces us to continually unsettle hierarchies of class, caste, gender, geography, and ability that persist within democratic post-colonial societies. She does this by assigning to subalternity the function of acting as a reminder against all simplistic intellectual generalizations aimed at restoring the word of the natives. Her framing of the subaltern as a figure who not only slipped through colonial subject formation, but who continues to have no access to lines of social mobility, even in the present, destabilizes juridical discourses of citizenship and freedom in contemporary post-colonial and democratic settler contexts, uh, settler colonial contexts by compelling us to historicize its assurances. So though these populations may have constitutional or do have constitutional guarantees and are citizens within these democracies, the subaltern serves as a figure that continually reminds us that discourses of freedom and rights combine what I earlier discussed as the visible apparatus of freedom with the invisible apparatus of unfreedom. Um, and so by interrogating the assumed subject of these universal projects of emancipation, scholars like Spivak have traced the strong effects of past and present exclusions, the effects of these exercise on the formation of subjectivities. So broadly speaking, by holding in tension the epistemic exclusion of non-Western thought 
a critique of processes of retrieval and simplistic and paternalistic claims of authenticity of voices and perspectives. Childhood studies can attend to the complexities of how workings of power and past histories continue to shape processes that seek to include previously excluded voices. Now, for my last point, um, I'd like to focus on post-colonial capitalism and the ways in which post-colonial economists offer a radically different analysis of post-colonial capitalism, including their critique of the historicist framework of transition that um, underlies Marxist theory. So one of the key theorists uh, on post-colonial capitalism has been Kalyan Sanyal. And what he's done is reframed surplus labor and primitive accumulation as part of the present process and not just the history of capital accumulation in contemporary post-colonial context. And in his case, he's talking particularly about India. These economists have argued that as post as that as a post-industrial global economy, the Indian economy works through two parallel registers of accumulation and need. So what they're trying to theorize is in the Indian context that more than 90% of the Indian economy is based on multiple modes of informal labor, and therefore the expansion of India's economy, informal economy, they view as essential and not incidental to India's spectacular economic growth. So by understanding it in terms of the economy of accumulation and the economy of need, the economy of accumulation is an exclusionary apparatus centered on the desire to create surplus wealth for industrial development and its requirements for an unending supply of land and mineral wealth are met by dispossessing marginal populations in rural and urban areas through using colonial laws. And economic development in India relies on processes of primitive accumulation, not just in its history, but also as a constitutive element of post-colonial capitalism. So for a large majority of the population that cannot be accommodated within this accumulation economy, remember more than 90% of that informal uh, labor that the country relies upon, the, it is the governmental apparatus of planning that provides minimal economic relief, a subsistence living that supplements low wages but is never adequate to propel these populations outside of futures beyond the growing informal sector. So broadly speaking, it is within this need economy that the marginal child is dominantly constructed. This means that programs directed at these children often exist within a compensatory imagination that addresses their minimum basic needs, including poor quality schools or the midday meal program. But these programs manage the deleterious effects of primitive accumulation and the increased privatization of state resources and welfare policies. But within these, marginal children are seldom viewed nor acted upon as citizens. So what I have shared here in terms of my five key points is something that I've developed in a full-fledged chapter in the recent Bloomsbury Handbook of Theories in Childhood Studies that I co-edited and my chapter called Theorizing Difference, Postcolonialism and Childhood Studies can be found in this edited volume. And I just want to end uh, by thanking you all for your time and sharing a list of partial references, some of which I've brought up in my presentation. Thank you.